Hello everybody, welcome to this second video about abstract interpretation of the compilation course. In this video, I will tell you a bit about theory and how do we construct the whole theory about abstract interpretation, what are the basic ideas, and how do we proceed to go from concrete semantics into abstract semantics. Let's go. So the objective of the section is to formalize what we said in the former video, which is how do we prove that the concrete semantics here in dark gray is included into the set of acceptable behaviors. Concretely, it means that we will define an abstract semantics here in light gray so that every single behavior of the concrete semantics is included into the abstract one and hopefully we will prove afterwards that this gray um, semantics is included into the set of acceptable behavior. So in this section I will speak about concrete semantics and abstract semantics. As usual in this course we will use the mini Y language um, which is a mini imperative language with assignments, sequence, tests, and loops. As for expression, we use the very same expression, numerical and Boolean expressions, where we add a new operator, which is called round, which has the same usual Python-like semantics, uh, and gives a random value between the evaluation of the left-hand argument to the right-hand argument. So let's come to concrete semantics that we already did in course number three. We begin with the expressions. And be careful, we define here the expressions in a, with a slight difference from the course number three of the CAP course. The semantics of expressions are now defined to have an image in a set of values. Uh, why? Because we want to deal with the new operator round, which is which now gives us a semantics, the set of all its possible values. So it has an impact on the semantics of the other expressions that should be defined as sets containing a unique element. As usual, we use an environment to store the current values of variables and the function sigma gives to any, va any variable of the program its current value. Now that we have expressions, we are able to define the small step semantics in terms of rules that use this, this arrow there. States at the left hand side and the right hand side of the rules are either tuples of as programs and memory or only memory when we deal with finite states. The idea is that we can express all the statements or the commands of the program in terms of change of the current memory stage. For instance, here, if we apply the assignment here on this memory, we get the very same memory where the value of x has been replaced by the current value of e. And as for while, the, while, the semantics is recursive. The while of semantics consists in making a first evaluation of B and then depending on its value, evaluating the body and continue or making a skip and the effect is computed on the current value of the memory. From this semantics we were able to define the semantics of a given term terminating program like that, beginning with the whole program and a memory where some variables have been or not initialized. We call each step of the semantics a transition, which enables us to define the next one. What we use in the following course, in this course we will define a slight ver different version of the concrete small step semantics onto a model of program that is a variant of the control program of the program. So let's say that we have the program here where statements have been labeled by numbers and 
the usual computation of the control flow graph might give us a model of program which is depicted like that, where each transition is either an assignment or a test. And this graph begins with the zero value for the control point there. This variant is called the transition systems, but we don't, don't really mind at that step. On these transition systems, we are able to express the very same concrete semantics, where we will define semantics of each single transition and then combine them in order to get the semantics of the whole program. A state is a pair from, uh, of a given control point here and a memory, and initial states are all the possible values inside the beginning control point, which is zero ever. And the question is, how do we change, how do we compute the counterpart of the former semantics, small step semantics for guards and for actions and next to the whole program? First of all, uh, we will re-express the semantics of the commands. From the former graph, all edges are of the same type, which is I come from a given control point, I've got a command, and then I, my destination is a given control point, and com is a command, which is either a guard or an action, which makes it easier to define the semantics because we only have two possibilities for the commands. For instance, the assignment semantics takes as input a set of valuations and of course the uh, content of the commands itself. And what it says is that the effect of this transition onto the set of valuations are the very same valuations where we have evaluated n and we get all this value and we assign each single value onto V. Okay, so this is always a set of valuations. I'll let you do the same exercise to here understand the second semantic which is depicted on the slide. So be careful, we now have sets of valuations here at the right hand side of the semantics. As an exercise, I'll let you compute the semantics with the initial set of valuation sigma which is this one, and where the common here is an assignment. So I'll let you make a pause on your video and make the exercise. Now that we have the semantics of commands, we are now able to define the whole semantics of the program. The program is depicted by a control flow graph labeled by L control points, and A is a set of transitions. Uh, we make the assumption that there is a unique initial control point, which is zero in all the rest of the course. The semantic of the program is defined as a map from all control points of the program to a set of valuations that are more or less a set of possible valuations that can be obtained by running the program. So we depict by L0 the best invariant at state at control point zero and RK the best invariant at the control point K. Of course, the set of all possible valuations at control point zero is the set of all valuations dots. And we can obtain by induction the set of all possible valuation coming into a control point k prime as the set of all contributions from incident edges coming from other people yeah k okay in which we apply the semantic of a command and here so here we have got this first command we apply the semantics and we get a contribution, we have another point here, we apply the semantics of the command there, and we have a contribution, and we make the union of all these input contributions. Okay, so this is a set defined as a fixed point, and the best invariant at each state 
at each control point is the smallest solution of this set of equations. The solution of this set of equations always exists by the knaster tarski theorem, and so the same we might want to compute it. So let's first make an example of that. I've got this program transformed into this control program there, in which I have an assignment to zero followed by a loop. And the objective here is to define what is the semantics of this program. So I give you the map here, which is the solution of the semantics of the program. Yeah, so it's a set of value and we say that the set of value can be any mapping from the variable x to any value in z. So it's a set of valuation. So what about control point three? Okay. The control point three has a great invariant, which is the set, which is unique, where x is equal to 100. Sorry, x maps to 100. This is a unique valuation. I let you do the other points. What is the concrete semantics at point one? What is the concrete semantics at point two? So this could be a pause in your video. So now that we have the final result, we will write the equations that should be solved in order to get this final result. I will only focus here on R1. Okay, so in order to get the equation concerning R1, we should look at all its incident edges. So there is one contribution coming from zero and one contribution coming from two. Let's focus on the contribution coming from zero. So we have the contribution coming from zero. And on that contribution, we should make the concrete semantics of x equals zero. So apply on R zero. And from the control point two, we should make explicit the concrete semantics of x plus plus onto R two. And the final result is the union between these two sets of valuations. I let you write the other equation, the equation for R2 and the equation for R3 that we should solve in order to get concretely the semantics of the program. So now that we have the equations, how do we solve them? As usual, we solve this system of equations by a fixed point iteration starting from the beginning, of starting from an empty set. Uh, so I denote by r up to zero or a up to i the current set of valuation that I get during this iteration. I start with all possible valuations for the initial control point and empty valuation, so I don't know anything about the other control point. And then I iterate. To compute the next iteration values from the last ones and the concrete semantics, we compute from that equation all contributions of incoming edges, which are named RK, of the previous step, and we apply the concrete semantics. Then we make the union of all these new sets and we are finally obtain the new RK k i plus 1, which is the new rk, at step i plus 1. If we have gone to a fixed point, then we wait on this step, else we continue. So be careful, this algorithm doesn't terminate in general, because it would have solved the solving problem. However, if it does, we have co effectively computed the concrete semantics.
So now that we have the concrete semantics, let's come to the abstract one. I recall the previous step from the previous lines, we got these fixed point equations that were used to define our new version of the concrete semantics of our wild programs. And from this equation, we solved using an iterative algorithm, a fixed point algorithm, uh, that we were able to compute sets of valuations that were growing. However, we to effectively put it in the computer, we have to cope with two problems. First of all, I didn't speak about representing the set of valuations that are involved in my algorithm. So I don't know which data structure to use. I didn't tell anything about effectively computing the semantics of uh, the commands. And I didn't tell anything about computing the units. Uh, moreover, there is a, still a problem because we don't know uh, whether or not the computation might be infinite. So make a pause and give an example of a program where the number of states can be infinite and from which it is impossible to compute the concrete semantics with the algorithm I gave you just before. Now that we are convinced that we have two problems to cope with, let's come to the first one. Represent set of valuation, which is find a way to represent in a machine inside a clever data structure element like this. The first of all, all the variables from now will be numbered and we will transform the set of variables into a vector of variables. So we will sort them in order to get a vector. So from this vector here, which is X and Y, we will be able to depict graphically valuations like that. Each point is, depicts a value of X and a value of Y, which means that each point depicts here a valuation in a program where we only have two variables. So these are the valuations we need to represent inside your machine. So if it's finite, of course, we can store it in a finite set, uh, but it won't be very useful since sets are quickly growing inside our program analysis and we still have to the problem of representing infinite sets. So the idea is to represent this set of value of variables by a finite superset here depicted in red, which is bigger, which always contains all the valuations I want to represent, but it's easier to represent. So here, for instance, the red set depicts all X and Y that are positives. Okay, so this is depicted, this is called sign. Here, we represent the set of valuations by a map from each variable onto a given interval. Let's say that X is in between 1 and 42 and Y is between 2 and 30. Okay, so this is called interval. I think at that point you should be convinced that this set here and here are representable in machine in efficient data structures. So now that we have stored these efficient sets in data structures, how do we compute all these sets for each control point? Okay, the idea is that now that semantic at each control point will be defined according as this new way of representing. For instance, here for the sign, the only information we'll propagate is that X is positive at the control point 42. So the question is now, how do we compute these abstract values, so in red, for each control point and still remain safe. Okay, so 
This is the second problem, computing the transition relation, computing the semantics. Now that we don't have valuations as inputs, but abstract values, which represent sets of valuations. So, now, so here it was the set of valuations, and now we have these sharp abstract values that represent set of valuation. But because we don't have the same typing, we cannot apply the semantics here of comments without translating it in the abstract world. So we will apply an abstract counterpart of each comment into our new abstract values. Similarly, because here the union is defined onto set of valuations, a new union should be defined onto sets of abstract values. Okay, so in order to transform our initial problem into a problem that speaks about abstract values, we should abstract every single common semantics and, ev and, um, and also the union. We have to change the concrete semantics into abstract semantics. And invent a proper compatible abstract union, so for example, how do we define x, the effect of this common on, I know that x is positive, that's okay, so this is RK sharp. Okay, perhaps we can put a set on it. See if now I have a transition coming from a state that applies x is greater than zero onto that. What should be the result? Because without any surprise, the effect of this test doesn't do anything onto the extract value. So the effect at the end is the same. I still know that this is this is his answer. I still know that x is positive. So now that we have the new version of the fixed point equations, we can now define an abstract algorithm, which is the abstract component part of the previous one, which basically consists in writing the abstract equations corresponding to the abstract semantics. Okay, this one. Okay, and then interpret the program from the beginning, from I know that every single valuation is able from the control point zero, and then Compute an abstract value element per control point and always make the union okay, with the abstract union and always means the union with the former value. And this is a fixed point iteration that can be stopped when the iteration has stabilized for all control points. I will now make a demo. And I just want before the demo to say that I stop when the iteration is stabilized. At, at some at that point, I didn't tell you whether or not this iteration stabilized or not in all cases. Begin. I take an example here of a program that makes stuff on x and y variables, and I just compile it into the control flow graph. And what I want now is to propagate the sign information for each variable at each control point. So whenever I know that x or y is positive, I put this notation. Whenever I know that x or y is negative, I give this notation. I use also another notation that says that a given value can be positive or negative, top and bottom. I don't know anything yet. And I will use from now vectors of value of x and value of y. Let's begin. Uh, first of all, I write the equations. So uh, you can make a pause now. I will just focus on this R2 equation. So that to explain, let's look here on control point two. To write the equation on control point two, I should look carefully about the contribution of incoming points. So four and one. Okay, so the new contribution of control 
on control point two is the union of the contribution of control one, where I know that y has been assigned a positive value. Point two is positive. Okay, so this is the first contribution. And the second contribution is the contribution that goes from F4, where I know that Y has been incremented by 4. Okay, I know that Y has been incremented by a positive value. Okay, so I... This example showed you all the cases. Okay, I make the abstract plus with a positive value. Okay, and make an assignment here. And I don't forget the abstract union that is useful to propagate and join all the values in the incoming edges. Okay, so now that we have this equation, I come back to get this read off. So I depict here in the table all the steps of my algorithm for all control points of my control flow graph. Here is step 0, step 1, step 2, and step 3, and I depict here in a vector the abstract value for x at the left and y at the right. So step 0, I initialize everyone to I don't know anything. And the very, very, very first, first step is to assign to the control point 0 the fact that every single valuation is possible, so top for x and top for y. Let's propagate on control point 1 from control point 0 and the semantics of the command. I know that x has been assigned a positive value. For control point 2, I don't know anything coming from y from here. Okay. However, I know that in the control point 1, x was positive, and from the semantics of the command here, I know that now y is assigned a 0 value. And I make the union, and from this union, I infer the fact that x and y has now positive abstract values. I continue. For R3, I propagate the information that I just got from 2 into 3, which is basically the, the copy. Now I use the semantics of uh, the minus, and because I don't know if x is greater than 2, I don't know anything about x anymore. So x remains to top. And I propagate into control point 5, which I remake an uh, intersection of the former abstract value in 2, and the fact that x has been tested to be negative. So I let you continue, make pause, okay, on each single step of this fixed point. Okay, at the end of iteration three, the two abstract values there and there are similar, which means that we have reached a fixed point and the theory says that if we reach a fixed point, then the abstract value that we get at the end are safe approximations of the invariants we are searching for. So for instance, at control point 4, I know for sure that y is always positive. At some point from the concrete semantics, we have defined an abstract semantics in terms of fixed points, and we, comp we have defined a new algorithm that enables us to propagate information in terms of abstract values. So what I claim is that abstracting this set of valuation is the key to define such new algorithms and make them decidable. However, at that point, I didn't talk about how to properly construct this abstract semantics so that to guarantee the correctness and also to guarantee that the fixed point iteration terminates by construction. So we need a bit more formalization which will be done in the next video.